My name is David Rudolph, and I am the director of Messianic Jewish Studies and a professor of New Testament and Jewish Studies at the King's University in South Lake, uh, Texas. I've written a book entitled uh, A Jew to the Jews, Jewish Contours of Pauline Flexibility in 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23, published by uh, Pickwick. Many uh, years ago, I was working as, a, um, as an assistant principal of a, a Messianic Jewish day school. And I was teaching uh, biblical studies and Jewish studies to um, uh, junior high students and high school students. And, and I was uh, preparing for one of my classes and reading a book written by James Dunn. And there was a really wonderful little chapter in there on the works of the law. And um, I was working through it, and, and, and when I realized his argument um, that the works of the law were um, Jewish boundary markers of, of distinction, uh, such as circumcision and um, um, food laws and festivals, things that defined the Jewish people, and that his argument was that through the coming of the Messiah, these Jewish boundary markers were erased. And, um, and therefore were no longer of importance to um, Jews in the present day, I realized that um, essentially what he was saying was that if the Jewish boundary markers of identity were erased, that Jewish people would be erased. And as a Messianic Jew, as a, as a Jewish uh, follower of Jesus who continues to live as a Jew, I, I, I was, you know, stunned by that, the implications of his argument, and I, I thought to myself, um, not only would the, um, the Jewish world be erased, but, um, but my family, my community, every, everything that I hold, hold dear, you know, as part of the Jewish world would be erased. And it was at that point that I thought to myself, who's responding to this this, the implications of this uh, new perspective argument. And, and then I realized no one from within my community was responding to that argument. And it was at that point that I, I had a sense of calling to go back to school and to get the credentials to be able to have a Messianic Jewish voice in the field of New Testament studies to be able to address arguments like that. And so that began a very long journey that led me from um, Gordon-Conwell to Cambridge University, where I began working on this whole subject of the Jewishness of Paul. And my initial proposal to um, the university was actually to uh, do research on a passage that addresses this, this question of Paul's Jewish identity directly. And that, um, that passage was Acts chapter 21, verses 17 through 26. And in that passage, Luke um, describes how Paul was returning to Jerusalem and James, or Yaakov, um, and the elders uh, greet him and they're excited about the things that he's been doing in, uh, in the diaspora, among the Gentiles. But they say to Paul, uh, we have heard these rumors about you, that you've been teaching Jews among, among the Gentiles to no longer circumcise your children and to no longer keep the, the customs of our people. And then uh, James says, this is what we want you to do to demonstrate that these rumors are false about you. And at that point, James says, what we want you to do is we want you to go into the temple with these four men who are under a vow, these, these Nazarites, and we want you to pay for their vows, and we want you to uh, purify yourself along with them, which would involve sacrifices. And we want you to do this so that all will know that there is nothing in to these rumors, that these rumors are false. Uh, 
and that you remain a Torah observant Jew. So it's, it's actually this um, incredible moment in the early body of Messiah, the early church, when they actually had Paul there, you know, where you could ask him, Paul, what do you really believe about this? And, um, and so instead of Paul saying, well, actually the rumors are true, I really, you know, do not encourage Jews to continue to live as Jews within the church. Um, instead, or, you know, actually the rumor is true, I, I don't live a Torah observant life. Instead, Paul goes into the temple and he does exactly what James asked him to do. And <clears throat> so, the, uh, the explicitness of that passage um, is, is powerful when, it, when you put it side by side with like the new perspective or traditional, pers pr pr traditional uh, readings of Paul. Uh, so I worked on that passage for, um, I would say, you know, a good six months during the beginnings of my doctoral research at Cambridge University. And I was making a lot of progress on it and I felt very, very good about the work. And my supervisor was also very positive. But one day um, I met for a supervision and, um, and my supervisor said to me, you know, I. I think uh, the work you're doing is fine. I'm very pleased with it. I think it, it will make a wonderful contribution to Lucan studies. But the reality is, is that in the field of New Testament studies, as you know, the Pauline epistles are given a priority over, over Luke's portrait of Paul. And so even if you marshal a very strong argument for uh, a narrative reading of this passage, and even if you, uh, you know, make a, uh, a very a very fine thesis, this is not going to have a huge impact in Pauline studies. And so in the course of my research, I came across uh, many different ways of explaining Paul's actions in Acts chapter 21. And um, among those explanations, one explanation was that this is so incredible, this could never have happened. This is just too fantastic. Luke must have made this up. And uh, there are other explanations like, uh, well, perhaps this was um, Paul backsliding. Perhaps he, you know, at that moment he, he uh, kind of fell back into his, his former way of life, his, his Judaism, um, from this, you know, this perspective of a dichotomy between Judaism and Christianity. Um, but I would say, and there were maybe five or, or six other explanations, but the two most um, commonly held explanations for Paul's, for Paul's behavior was, one, this is a historical fiction, and two, that Paul was becoming all things to all people. That to the Jews, he was becoming, as a Jew, to win the Jews. Uh, to those under the law, he was becoming as one under the law to win those under the law. To the weak, he was becoming as the weak to win the weak. And that this was uh, just a very, um, a very typical example of his principle of flexibility, which is described in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, where he says that he becomes all things to all people um, in order to win them to the gospel. So my supervisor uh, recommended that perhaps I should consider uh, focus, refocusing my research on 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, addressing that head-on, and then using Acts 21, the situation in Acts 21, as a test case of, of whether or not this actually falls within the scope of, of what Paul is describing in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm so grateful to my supervisor that he you know, suggested that because I, fe I feel that what it did is it, it, uh, it brought me into the whole field of Pauline studies and, uh, and suddenly I was engaging uh, directly with, um, you know, the, Paul's heart and, and thoughts, you know, with the words that he, that he wrote himself. And so I, I spent uh, the next four and a half years or so working 
on, I mean, essentially it was five years working on five verses, uh, 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. And while some people might think, you know, that's, uh, maybe is that your best use of time? <laughs> um, but actually this passage is like a hub because it intersects with so many different questions that we have in New Testament studies with regard to Paul's, Paul's identity as a Jew, with his ethics, with his relationship to the Jewish people, with his sense of who he is in the Messiah, with um, the question of the relationship between his Jewish identity and his uh, new creation identity, his, his new covenant identity, and uh, all these questions. And so how one interprets 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, often has a huge bearing on how they read other texts, many other texts, like Acts chapter 21. The traditional reading of Paul is that Paul grew up in a, in a very uh, strict uh, sectarian Jewish environment, that he was a Pharisee, uh, even a Pharisee of Pharisees, that he he was so committed to his uh, Jewish religious identity that he even uh, pursued early Jewish followers of Jesus, early Messianic Jews, um, and, that, and that he was um, scrupulous in his observance of the Torah. And then, at the point at which he encountered the, the resurrected, the risen Messiah, he, he experienced an epiphany that his identity was no longer in Israel, um, in, uh, among the Jewish people, that this was no longer a, a, a significant part of his identity, but that now he was in Messiah and that, and that he um, he now could leave behind his Jewish practices, his Jewish way of life. He, he, no longer, he no longer had a covenantal responsibility to live as a Jew. And now, being free from these things, um, to live as a Jew was merely a matter of, um, of choice and, uh, and missionary uh, imperative. So if a particular environment in which he was reaching out with the gospel uh, made it uh, advantageous for him to live as a Jew, then he would, um, he would take on uh, or put back on his Jewish identity. But when he would move into another environment that um, was not advantageous, maybe when he was preaching to, to Gentiles, then he would remove uh, his, his, his kind of Jewish garb. And so, and so um, a very traditional reading of 1 Corinthians 9 is that Paul was this almost chameleon that would uh, change back and forth depending on his, on his environment. And there are a number of problems uh, with that way of, of viewing Paul. Uh, one is that it simply is not realistic. Uh, it's, it simply is not it is not realistic that he was always in a Jewish environment where there were no non-Jews there, or that he was always in a non-Jewish environment and there were no Jews there. In fact, uh, when we read through Acts, when we read through his letters, we get the impression that actually uh, on, on many of these occasions, he's, when he's preaching the gospel, he's, he's among Jews and Gentiles. So that would make it impossible for him to kind of oscillate back and forth in this kind of chameleon-like way. The other um, thing that really calls into question whether this kind of traditional reading of Paul in 1 Corinthians 9 is, is accurate is that it makes Jews out to be fools because it suggests that Jew Jewish people would not know that he, over here, he's looking like a very traditional Jew, like somebody who's, you know, keeping the Torah and very observant. But that uh, five minutes later, he goes down the street, and no one would notice that actually he takes off all these things and then acts in a totally different way. 
it's a completely it's a completely um, negative view of Jewish people and their their perceptions of things. And then I would say the final thing about it that, or at least a, a third major problem with this kind of traditional way of, of viewing Paul, is that it um, it would have undermined his the very the very um, uh, the very gospel that he was he was hoping to share. If we read Acts chapter twenty one as an example of Paul becoming all things to all uh, becoming all things to all people, uh, becoming a Jew to the Jews, what we're essentially saying is is that here he goes into the temple with these four Nazarites. He's looking very pious. He you know he himself is described as a Nazarite in chapter eighteen. He pays for their purification rites, and then. Um, the idea is, it, with this particular reading, that as he then moves on and journeys toward, let's say, Rome, that, um, that the Jews in Jerusalem uh, would not realize that he, he would be then changing back into his kind of Gentile um, way of, of um, of uh, dressing or communicating or acting and behaving. And, and, uh, but the reality is, is that if that actually happened, if, if Paul actually did that, it would have undermined the gospel because people would have thought that he was deceitful, that, you know, that he was a hypocrite, that, on, that he, over here he does one thing, but over here he does another thing. He gives the appearance of being a Torah observant Jew when in reality, that's not the truth about him. So it would have undermined his credibility, it would have undermined his integrity, and that would have ultimately undermined the gospel witness. Another problem with that particular reading of Acts 21, by the way, is that in the Acts 21 context, you're not even dealing with the issue of Jewish people who do not believe in Jesus. You're dealing with James and the elders and you know, the, this is the core of the early community of the followers of Jesus. These are, these were people who were followers of Jesus before Paul was a follower of Jesus. So there's even some question as to whether this is a, a, a gospel or mission context in the way in which um, 1 Corinthians 9 seems to describe, you know, Paul's principle of flexibility. So, yeah, the traditional reading of 1 Corinthians 9 is a Paul who is, who is a, a kind of chameleon who oscillates back and forth between his Jewish identity and, and a non-Jewish behavior, eating pork on the one hand, but when he's, when, when he's with Jewish people, he pretends to be very Torah observant. And, um, and the ethics of this particular way of, of of portraying Paul is something that's not typically thought through in New Testament studies. And I, I think this is one of the contributions of, of this book, A Jew to the Jews, that it, it raises this ethical issue and, and it seeks to press it and ask ourselves, does this line up with the way in which Paul describes himself in his letters as one who does not use trickery or deceit? in the way in which he shares the gospel. The context of 1 Corinthians 9 is very interesting. Um, if we read 1 Corinthians 9 in the context of 1 Corinthians 7 through 11 and 12, we, we get, I think, a better sense of what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 9. So one of the things that he lays out is, uh, he says, this is my rule in all the churches and all the congregations. And he says, if you are circumcised, remain circumcised. If you are uncircum and, and he says, if you are circumcised, remain circumcised, do not become uncircumcised. And then he says, if you are uncircumcised, remain uncircumcised, do not become circumcised. There's, there's, there's no evidence that Paul is here um, speaking literally, you know, that someone who is circumcised should uh, not become uncircumcised. It's more likely that uh, the language there is the language of metonymy. What he's really saying is, and he often uses the term circumcision 
as a metonymy for Jew or for Jewish. So it's more likely that what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 7, 17 through 24 is this is my rule in all the churches, all the congregations. <clears throat> if you are Jewish, remain Jewish. Don't stop being Jewish. Don't assimilate like what happened during the Maccabean period. If you are not Jewish, don't seek to become Jewish. Stay non-Jewish. And that totally agrees with his letter to the Galatians and his letter to the Romans that, that the body of Messiah is, is this wonderful community of Jews and Gentiles where the, where the relationship between them is a relationship of interdependence and mutual blessing. So in 1 Corinthians 7, he lays out this rule, and of course, Paul is circumcised. Paul is a Jew. And so if his rule is for Jews to continue to remain Jews and not become assimilated and take on Gentile identity, he can't teach that to others and not live that out himself. So he must be a, a living embodiment of his own rule. So that lays out a, a very important principle that uh, precedes the 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 11 section. And if we begin with that rule, it's, it's, we already have a kind of benchmark from which we can begin interpreting the remaining chapters. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10, he talks about um, the whole subject of food sacrifice to idols and how should we handle it when we go into someone's house and they're you know, serving food from the marketplace and we don't know the origin of this food, is it appropriate to eat it, and, and is it appropriate for a follower of Jesus to go into a temple and eat food sacrifice to idols there. And essentially, uh, Paul ends up saying, um, if you do not know the origin of the food, and it comes from the marketplace, go ahead, it's okay to eat it. Um, but he says if you know the origin of it, if you know that it's, it's food sacrificed to idols, don't eat it. And he also says if, if, uh, if it's food that's on the altar, don't eat it. And uh, for the first several centuries of the early church, this was how the early church interpreted 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10. This is a very uh, food-focused, uh, uh, food uh, table fellowship-focused section. Now what's interesting is, um, so it's very much related to this whole issue of, of, uh, of, of eating, food and eating, table fellowship. Now what's interesting is 1 Corinthians 9 is this chapter that's like right there in the middle of 1 Corinthians 8 and 10. But most people treat it as though it's a, a, you know, a, a digression, as though it has nothing to do with those two chapters. But there's really no indication that Paul is now beginning a completely separate um, subject. It's more likely that actually he's continuing to talk about this whole issue of, of, um, of table fellowship and food and eating, and now he's kind of He's, he's, he's speaking about his personal example, how he deals with these issues. So when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the light of 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10, a very, a very reasonable question to ask is when Paul says um, to the Jews he became as a Jew to win the Jews, is it possible that here he's still talking about this table fellowship context? Um, or that when he goes to those under the law, he becomes as one under the law. So not, in other words, not in every situation, wherever there's a Jew, he just kind of like a chameleon, you know, uh, becomes like them. But that perhaps in a table fellowship context, there's a sense in which he accommodates to the host that, of the house that he enters. Or um, to, the, to those uh, outside of the law, he becomes as one outside of the law. But then, interestingly, he says, though I am not without God's law. So when it comes to the Gentiles, those outside of the law, those without the law, 
There he has this, um, this very significant caveat, though I am not without God's law. And that seems to be a kind of continuation of what he says in 1 Corinthians 7. If you are circumcised, remain circumcised. Don't become uncircumcised. If you're Jewish, remain Jewish. Don't assimilate. In 1 Corinthians 9, continuing that same thread, he says, though uh, even when I become, uh, when I adapt, when I accommodate, to, uh, let's say, table fellowship in the home of a Gentile, I'm still not without God's law. And in fact, in that whole 1 Corinthians 8 through uh, 10 uh, section, the way in which he is um, evaluating, and I would say halachically evaluating, whether it's acceptable to eat the food in in that um, particular person's home, uh, not being aware of the origin of the food or with respect to the altar, he is approaching these things in a very Jewish way. I would even say a very phar- Pharisaic way, even a very Halalite Pharisaic way, because um, Halal, the, the, the school of Halal was, um, was known for, um, for um, believing essentially that food was not unclean in and of itself. In other words, there was no ontological uncleanness. And so, in a sense, Paul arguably is using his, his Jewish learning, his Jewish understanding, his Jewish halachic understanding to evaluate these table fellowship questions in chapters 8 and 10. In chapter 9, he's talking about his own personal experience of when he goes into different homes, how he enters Jewish homes, how he enters Gentile homes, and as I said, he adds this caveat, though I am not without God's law, Um, and then he goes on to say, but I am in Messiah's law. I'm in the law of Christ. I'm in Christ's law. So what does that mean? I'm in Christ's law. Well, it's very interesting that when you get to the very end of chapter 10, chapter 10 verses 32 through 33 and then into chapter 11 verse 1 and in the greek text there's actually no chapter division it's just a continuation so 1032 actually in the greek continues directly into 11 1. what you find is that at the very end of this section paul has something of a recapitulation of what he says in first corinthians 9. so there's a direct correspondence between 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, and 1 Corinthians 10, 32 through 33. It's like a, a summary of, his, of what he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. Then what he does is he tags on to the very end very significant words. He says, be imitators of me as I am of the Messiah. And I just, in the course of my research at Cambridge, you know, I, I spent so many, um, so many nights just reflecting on those words, be imitators of me as I am of Messiah, as I am of Christ. You know, what does that mean? In what way was Paul imitating the Messiah? How was Paul, in the context of 1 Corinthians 7 through 10 into 11, imitating the Lord Jesus, the Lord Yeshua, the Messiah. How is he doing that? And there are several possibilities. Um, For example, one possibility is that in the same way that, that the Messiah, Christ, the King of Israel, the Melech HaMlachim, came down from heaven as the Holy One of Israel, as, as a divine Messiah, and as in like Philippians chapter 2, it describes how he lowered himself and became um, as nothing and took on the form of, of, of humanity and became human flesh, took on human flesh and became a man. That perhaps what Paul was saying was that uh, in the same way as in Philippians 2, he says, and so be like-minded. That perhaps what he was saying was, uh, 
be imitators of me as I am of Christ in the sense that Christ condescended, I condescended, I condescend to others in the course of my ministry. And so I encourage you to follow my example to condescend. So that's one possible way of reading it. Um, and I think there's a, a lot of merit to it. Um, another possible way, and and I don't think these, these are always uh, either or, uh, they can be both and, is that um, when Jesus sent out his disciples to um, share that the kingdom of God was near, and we read about this in Luke chapter 10, he sends out uh, 72 uh, disciples. And he says, you know, go into the villages and, and uh, you know, and tell them the kingdom of God is near. And then he says something very interesting. He says, he says um, if they welcome you in that village, he says, eat what is set before you. Eat what is set before you. And so this is like a, like a travel rule. It's like uh, Jesus' travel rule. Eat what is set before you. And interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul actually says something very similar. It's very similar to eat what is set before you. But what's interesting is, whereas some people think that when they uh, read 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, when they read Luke chapter 10, uh, that Jesus was sending his disciples out into, um, among the Gentiles. And so eat what is set before you means like eat, eat the pork or eat the uh, trafe, the unkosher food that's set before you. If we read Luke's, uh, you know, two-volume uh, diptych, his, you know, Luke Acts uh, with the sequel there, um, the Gentile mission doesn't, doesn't even come into existence until uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11. You know, we, we hear about the Gentile mission at the, in Luke chapter 24, and then it's reiterated in Acts chapters 1 and 2, but we don't actually have the beginnings of, of the mission to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10 and 11 with Cornelius and his family. Okay, we've got an Ethiopian eunuch, you know, a little earlier, but um, that's on the way to this, this real genuine, you know, mission to the Gentiles, the one where Peter says that, you know, he has difficulty entering Cornelius' house because uh, they're Gentiles. If Peter was aware of Jesus' travel rule and Jesus had sent the disciples into Gentile villages, then certainly Peter would have had no problem in Acts chapters 10 and 11 entering Cornelius' house and, and associating with these Gentiles because Peter and you know, the other followers of Jesus earlier on would have heard from Jesus that's completely okay to do. So when we actually look at the chronology of Luke's narrative and we realize that the Gentile mission doesn't come into play until much, much later in, in the narrative, Acts chapters 10 and 11, then we realize that in Luke chapter 10, the villages that Jesus is sending his disciples into are Jewish villages. So, so why does he say, eat what is set before you? Because, and this is very important for New Testament studies and, and, uh, and doing New Testament studies in light of Second Temple Judaism because Second Temple Judaism was diverse because not all Jews are the same, that we should not have this monolithic view of, of Jews that all Jews practiced um, uh, the Jewish dietary laws in the same way or that all Jews um, had the same standards of ritual purity. So the standard of the disciples as, as this, of these 72 that were sent out would have been varied. And as they went into these many different villages, they would have encountered Jews from uh, you know, various traditions and, and different, having differing standards of, of uh, kashrut, differing standards of purity. And, and essentially what Jesus was saying when we look at it within this intra-Jewish context is that you need, his travel rule is essentially you need to be halachically flexible. You need to adapt to the halachic standards of the Jewish household that you go into. So again, 
Paul said, be imitators of me as I am of Christ, be imitators of me as I am of Jesus, be imitators of me as I am of the Messiah. One possibility is that he was talking about Jesus' condescension, his coming down, his becoming a human being, his lowering himself, and us having that humility in our mindset and humbling ourselves before others when we're sharing the Basura, the gospel, the good news. Another possibility is that Paul, especially in light of his language in 1 Corinthians 10, is that Paul might be thinking of, in, in that food context, that table fellowship context, that Paul might have been thinking about Jesus' travel rule of um, eat what is set before you. And then Paul taking that travel rule as kind of the law of Messiah, the, the rule of Messiah, and then halakhically applying that in the context of his table fellowship context where food and table fellowship were involved. A third possibility, and this is the one that I really ran with, and I just, um, I, thought, I thought most of the evidence pointed to, but again, not in a either or sense, I think the other two possibilities can also be um, brought into what Paul meant is that in the same way that Jesus ate with ordinary Jews, just regular, the crowds, those who sat with him on, on the hillsides of Israel, but he also ate with and shared table fellowship with the Pharisees, the, um, uh, the stricter Jews, uh, sectarian Jews. And at the same time, he also ate with the sinners, the Jewish sinners, and the, the tax collectors who are also kind of lumped in with these Jewish sinners. So in the same way that Jesus ate with, with uh, ordinary Jews, uh, Pharisees, and Jewish sinners, Paul may have followed that model of Jesus. And in the same way Paul ate with ordinary Jews of many different stripes from many different cultural backgrounds within the wider Mediterranean culture as he was traveling around. Paul would have eaten with ordinary Jews, Pharisees, those under a strict interpretation of the law, because he was a Pharisee. He certainly would have, when he returned to Jerusalem, when he returned to the Eretz Yisrael, when he returned to Israel, he would have, he would have eaten with um, members of his family who were Pharisees, uh, his uh, broader community that he was uh, a part of as he grew up. Um, so he would have eaten with ordinary Jews of many different kinds. He would have eaten with um, those under the law in a particularly strict or sectarian way. And he would have also eaten with those Gentile sinners, those who were outside of the law. And so when we look at the the similarity between the, the different kinds of people that Jesus ate with and shared table fellowship with, and how that was the primary way that Jesus ministered to the people. Primary way was really not through, um, you know, the large crowds and preaching from hilltops. It was through the, the daily entering someone's home and um, breaking bread with them and, and, and sitting at a meal with them and sharing about the kingdom of God with them. And similarly, um, Paul, Paul's ministry was largely a ministry of traveling from place to place. And even when he was within one location, eat, eating in the homes of, of the people within that community and entering into their lives even as they entered into his life. And as they entered into his life, as he shared with them through table fellowship, um, as they, uh, through table fellowship, there was a kind of interchange. The people would, would, he would participate in their lives, and at the same time, they would participate in his life. And central to his life was the Messiah. So the central thesis of my argument is that when Paul says that he becomes all things to all people, um, that we're not talking about wherever he was, he was just like a, you know, this chameleon, but that in the context of 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 and into 11, 
in the wider context of chapter 7, Paul is talking about his table fellowship, his eating with people, how he, he adapted and accommodated to um, the, the, the homes that he entered, and that in the same way that Jesus ate with ordinary Jews and with uh, Pharisees and with Jewish sinners, Paul uh, in the same way became all things to all people and, and ate with um, ordinary Jews of all kinds. Uh, with those who were under the law in a particularly strict way, like Pharisees and other sectarian Jews, and that uh, he also went as, his, as the apostle to the Gentiles, to the Gentile sinners, and that in that sense he was, he was becoming an imitator of the Messiah. <laughs>